E, I, I see. There it goes. Okay. Okay, so it looks like it's recording. Great. And so, um, so let me introduce Professor Phil Bott. So, um, so first of all, it is a pleasure to introduce Professor Phil Bott. I've known him. We were trying to figure uh, when we first met, you know. Uh, we've known each other for probably almost two decades at this point. And, um, and I actually probably knew his work before we met because I can, can, I can re uh, distinctly remembering or, um, reading his papers and uh, saying, you know, and I couldn't see his face yet. So, so I just knew the name, Phil Bott. And he wrote seminal papers right after his PhD and his, uh, just when he got to LSU about um, the Antarctic ice sheet changes over the last 20 million years, basically Miocene, late Miocene, and so on and so forth. On a personal note, um, Phil and, and his wife, uh, Sophie, invited me to give a talk at LSU about 12 years ago as a um, part of the IUDP lecture series. And uh, I stayed, my wife and I stayed with them. We got to know each other even better. And so it's such a pleasure to, to reciprocate, even though we've been talking about having come up to New York City, you know. So, um, so Phil got his uh, bachelor's degree in geology. Um, at the University of New Orleans, and then went on for his master's and PhD at Rice University, getting his PhD in 1997. Um, from what I saw in your bio, you didn't even have a postdoc, right? You just went right into LSU. Yeah. Louisiana State you. University. Good yeah. for you. And he's been there ever since, okay? Right. Um, he's got a beautiful life there. Bill's research has been focusing on the late Cenozoic, basically the last 20 million years, I would say, of the ice sheets in Antarctica. He uses um, seismic stratigraphy, which is using sound waves to image below the, um, uh, the sea floor to uh, image these sediments, sedimentary layers, basically kind of like a sonogram of Mother Earth. And he does this on the continental shelf of Antarctica. Uh, he's led, a, I don't I lost count. How many uh, expeditions have you been on? <laughs> I think it's eight. <laughs> only, only eight. It feels like more. Yeah, it's all, the, all the papers, it feels like more. <laughs> uh, to the Ross Sea, the Antarctic Peninsula, and it's resulted in like groundbreaking research, rewriting in some cases, or developing new hypotheses and new paradigms about Antarctica and the ice sheets that rest on this frozen continent. And in fact, he's going to return to Antarctica on the research vessel Palmer, so he'll talk about that. I don't want to give away some of the stuff. So today, Phil will discuss the new findings him and his team has made on the ice sheet retreat during the last glacial period, at the very end of the last glacial period that ended around between 10 and 15,000 years ago. And his talk is entitled, Post-LGM Retreat of the Binch Lager uh, Ice Stream from the Eastern Ross Sea Continental Margin. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much, Steve. And uh, thanks to the department for inviting me to, to, uh, to do the lecture. So it's uh, much appreciated. And I, I can't believe it's been that number of years since you visited us in, in LSU. It was 12 years, uh, eight years ago. The yeah. time just goes way too fast, right? Yeah. So, uh, but I'll jump right in. And um, I, the first thing I'm gonna show here is a, a, a video. It's based on tons of, of, um, of, of satellite information and it's showing ice flow. So it's from an NSF funded project. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the folks at UCAL, Irvine, but many, many, many others. So it's tons of satellite information. They got a little uh, blurb here. I'm gonna advance it, but I do wanna make sure I give them credit. This is not my video, but there, there's Antarctica. And this is uh, an image showing in color the flow. The purple is the fastest. The purple and the blue are floating ice shelves. Everywhere else, it's grounded onto the sea floor or land that's above water. The big one on the right, the purple zone, is the Ross ice shell. The one in the middle is Pine Island. And then there's the, the, um, the, the Rhone Filchner on the left side. So the, the orange is barely moving. The blues are several hundred meters per year. Here's another image. They're gonna focus on the Pine Island system here. The Pine Island and the Thwaites are losing tons of ice, crazy volumes of ice on the order of several hundreds of uh, tens of uh, gigatons. I think even the, the, the recent numbers are saying it's losing something on the order of 100 gigatons per year. So phenomenal discharge. In that area, um, it, it's mostly 
a melting problem. There's warm water that's intruding below the shelf and it's melting the terminus. The satellites are showing that those areas are, um, are deflating and accelerating and the ice shelf is shrinking so you're losing a lot of buttressing. So uh, really important, important area. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the work we, um, we've been doing in the eastern Ross Sea. That's a big part, a drainage catchment area for um, the east and west Antarctic ice sheet, captures about 30%. Um, I've got my name there, I'm Phil Bart, and um, these are some folks that uh, you may know. You probably know the first guy, some of the uh, professors there, because Matthew uh, De Cesare is an alum of your department. Matthew did a PhD with me. He's now at, at Auburn. Um, but there are uh, other folks there who uh, all contributed to this work, and that's not even, even all of the folks. I do want to mention that uh, this work was, was funded by NSF. What you see in the center is the uh, Nathaniel B. Palmer. That's one of two uh, vessels that the U.S. operates in, um, in the Antarctic. So there's a, a, a photo of us when, well, when we were flying in by helicopter. That particular year, we couldn't actually get the ship to come all the way to McMurdo like we usually do. Uh, Steve mentioned that I've got a, um, uh, another project, and I wanted to say just a couple of words about that because I'm super excited about it. And um, what you see here is a picture of the continent. This is it's the Ross Sea. I hope you can see my cursor. And uh, this is the Ross Ice Shelf, okay? It's the size of Texas. It's the largest floating ice shelf in the world. The other blue areas are, are ice streams where the ice is flowing quickly, the blues and the purples that you saw in the previous image. So the, um, the project concerns Ross Banks. I'll provide a little bit of context. The, the dash line here is the shelf edge. That's the edge of the continental shelf. <clears throat> this solid line, is it's called the grounding line. That's where ice is so thick that it's pinned to the seafloor. All of this stuff here in this color blue beyond the grounding line is the floating ice shell. As much as you know, 700, 800, 900 meters thick on this end near the grounding line, and then about 200, 300 meters here at the calving front. That dimension of the ice shelf is controlled by Ross Island, which is a volcanic island on the west side, and Roosevelt Island, which is a bank. It's a submarine bank, but it comes up to about 150 meters. So with that ice thickness, the ice shelf is pinned to it. It's a really important controlling uh, you know, point that's uh, controlling its, uh, its, its current configuration. So the line that just came up there, this one, that's the calving front. That's the place from which the big icebergs break off. So that dimension, partly controlled by those, um, those features, the island and the bank. And then in the red box, those little funny uh, lines are bathymetric contours. That's Ross Bank. It's super shallow, very, very shallow. Here's on the bottom a cross section of Ross Bank from the west across the crest of Ross Bank into the adjacent trough. And it's a line drawing that was made from seismic that crosses the area. And the only thing I want to kind of point out to you is the, the bathymetry. So this is, you know, at 170 meters below seafloor. This blue is a cartoon of what we think the ice shelf looked like in the past at some point. So at some point, we think the, the ice shelf was actually pinned to here, and it's since destabilized. So if that were the case, this paleo rise has gone through some event that caused it to unpin. The calving front moves south by a couple of hundred kilometers and we've got this new configuration. So our objective in the season that's coming up is to investigate the question of, well, was Ross Bank a paleo pinning point for the Ross Ice Shell? If so, when did it cease to being a pinning point? And why did it unpin at that time? So lots of significance for that, Not lots of significance, because there's tons of ice rises and ice rumples all around the continent, and they're controlling the current configuration of the ice sheet, help keeping it in that that size, keeping it from flowing more rapidly to the ocean. There's a lot of carbonate 
on the bank crest. This is from a box core. We see foraminifera, we see bivalves, there are tons of sponges. There's even some coral gastropods. So uh, lots of stuff that we should be able to radiocarbon date. And so we're gonna go out and do a full survey of the bank over two seasons. And maybe uh, if we get some good results, we, you can invite us back and we'd be happy to share those results with you guys. Uh, what you see down here on the bottom is a, an image from NASA and that's showing the ice sheet at the LGM 20,000-ish years ago. And then since that time, it's contracted to this sort of configuration. Tons of vertical exaggeration here. These are the, uh, the trans-Antarctic mountains and other mountains that are exposed. But that's, we're looking at the, uh, the Ross ice shelf, this flat area. And there's the rest of the West Antarctic ice sheet. There's Roosevelt Island that you can see here, the ice rise. Okay, this is another image of the continent now. Ross Sea is here. So there's North, but North is everywhere, right? And uh, so that's the, the Ross Ice Shelf. And, and what I'm gonna show here is a zoomed in image of Ross Sea. And the blue are showing ice streams, these zones of fast flow that must have existed during the last glacial maximum when ice had expanded out all the way to the shelf edge. This is basically from Conway et al. I made a, a cartoon of showing what they present. It was the retreat history. And you can see tons of dashed lines. They could step back to here and then to that location and then here, hung out there for a while and then moved back to where it is now. So the brown are, are shallow areas. Those are the banks. And in between the bank, there are deep troughs that were carved by this fast flowing um, ice stream. So, so that's a, a view that's been around since 1999. There have been lots of stuff. There, John Anderson did an update in 2013 uh, uh, as well. So it's, it's changing. And we're learning more and more and more about the retreat history. So we, we're focused on uh, a lot of um, this eastern part of Rossi. I mentioned Ross Bank, that would be here. I'm looking at the Whale Steep Basin. and I've done some work in Glomer Challenger and we're hoping to get over to a little America at some point. But most of these studies to date have taken, uh, you know, focused on the ice streams because they produce a lot of sediment and it leaves a record, either a morphologic record or something indicating that the ice stream used to be there. So we use this kind of reconnaissance level approach to survey the troughs. This is a cartoon showing how uh, these deposits are formed. So there's an ice stream in cross section with an ice shelf, there's sea level, and you can see the ice is always flowing offshore and it carries debris either in the ice or in a subglacial deforming till. And that sediment is deposited at the grounding line and that contributes to, this is a seismic line, to this feature here, this is mostly till, and it produces uh, what's called a, a grounding zone wedge. And then eventually ice retreats back, there's the ice shelf, and then even that will move away. And you get this transition from till to sub-ice shelf sediment to open marine sediment. So we can tell a lot about the retreat from geophysical data, but also from sedimentologic data. So lots of ideas about what caused it retreat. If you've kind of worked with glacial system, you know, one of the big things we talk about is the solar impact. And doesn't seem to have as much effect in the northern, uh, the southern hemisphere, but that's a, a consideration. Another is sea level change. When Steve and I were getting out of grad school, the big hypothesis was sea level falls cause the ice sheet to advance, sea level rise causes it to retreat. That's fallen out of favor a bit. Uh, now we know that there are many places where warm water is intruding, the circumpolar deep water is upwelling in the Southern Ocean, moving south onto the continental shelf and actually coming in contact with floating ice causing massive amounts of mel melting. I mentioned the Pine Island and the Thwaites Glacier. So the satellites are showing those deflating and it's due to melting of war by warm waters that we know are present. So, so that's the, uh, the current view. What you see here is some of the, uh, a map from Masola and, and, uh, uh, and Anderson. Amanda Masola mapped out in the troughs, the Glomer Challenger the whale steep in Little America, this reconnaissance approach. And there the blue arrow is showing what must have been an ice stream 
in between a bank and a bank, Hayes and, and House. And, and based on their, that survey, it's a multi-beam and seismic survey, they determined there must have been a deposit out here on the outermost shelf. They see some subglacially formed lineations. There must have been a pause in the grounding line position here because there's an enormous pile of sediment there. There's a smaller pile here. And so they, they, they argue that there were three basically episodes of deposition associated with the LGM and the post-LGM retreat. It's really reconnaissance level, not a lot of data there, right? So, so this is actually our line that we got in 2015, but I superimposed upon it their interpretation of grounding zone wedge 5A, that's the LGM age deposit, grounding zone wedge 5B, the big pile, it's vertically exaggerated by more than 100 to 1. Here's the bump that they associated with 5C. The chronology is from acid insoluble organics. It's really not good. It's telling uh, some story that, uh, that the authors didn't believe. They think they have to, have to do some better job with the, uh, the chronology. So uh, that's the, uh, the image from Rigno that's kind of famous in the, the colors are showing the magnitudes of flow. It was from this type of image that those, uh, the video was created. So we're seeing again, raw sea in here. Here's the whale steep basin. So that's the fast flow in the ice shelf. And, um, and so this is the East Antarctic ice sheet. That's the West Antarctic ice sheet separated by the Transantarctic mountains. This fat zone of fast flow, you see the purple, it's referred to as the Ben Shadler ice stream. And it has a well-defined catchment area. That's its drainage area. Okay. At the last glacial maximum, that one had expanded all the way out into the, the Wales Deep Basin. So there's the grounding line at present. And there's the ice shell calving front. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is talk about uh, these four different topics. I'll start with uh, seismic. And our overall objective here is to try to understand the details of retreat. How did the West Antarctic ice sheet vacate this eastern part of, of Ross Sea. So we'll start with the seismic, and I'm gonna pop through quite a few of, of these, uh, but basically we wanna identify where are the deposits. That's the first thing we do is to get this regional scale view of where was deposition occurring during the retreat. This is some of the folks who um, assist us, and they're deploying the seismic. This is the air gun. These are generator injector air guns with about 2,000 PSI. We fire them every five seconds while we're underway at about five knots. They stay about two meters above the seafloor because we deploy these big floats. And they get a pretty good record of both the seafloor plus the subsurface stratigraphy. Boy, did we get lucky in 2015. This is uh, now north is down. This is the grounding line the calving front of Ross ice shelf, okay? Ice flows from here and from there. This is open water and it's remarkably open water. I've never seen it like that um, in the, the eight or so cruises that I've made. And it, it really is the folks who look at sea ice say, wow, that was a really great year. And we got lucky, that's when our ship time was. I'm sorry to keep rotating north on you, but, but in, uh, this image, this is the raw side shelf, north is this way. So we're, we're showing here in B, that's the Ben Shadler Ice Streams catchment area. And that the LGM, it expanded into this part of, um, of, of, of uh, Ross Sea. That's the Wales Deep Basin. And now I'm going to show you the area highlighted in that box. This is that area. The areas in gray are shallower than 500 meters. So here's Ross Bank from before 170. This is the Hayes and the Houts Bank. There's Roosevelt Island below the ice shelf whose calving front is here. So here's the big trough. That's the whale steep basin. It's got an enormous saddle across here. That's the line, the reconnaissance line that Masola and Anderson used to identify grounding zone wedge 5A grounding zone wedge 5B, grounding zone wedge 5C in here. And, and since then, there's been a whole lot more seismic. The, the, um, the gray lines, rectilinear lines, are seismic data 
that cross the whale's feet basin. Lots and lots of data. Data rich, one of the best places. And, and uh, so I showed you that line before, and I'm putting this box because up in here, we acquired a really, really large multi-beam survey. So we moved from this reconnaissance to getting these really full coverage. That's about 100 kilometers across. So really, really big survey that we got in 2015. And we had this, like I said, fantastic open water. This is the seismic line right down the axis of the Whale's Deep Basin going from the south end close to the calving front across that little bump 5C, the big bump, that's the bathymetric saddle 5C, out to the shelf edge, and then you go off onto the, uh, the upper slope. So lots of vertical exaggeration. Below is our interpretation of that line. And, and so actually it's a, it's, a, it's a compound grounding zone wedge. It's composed of a lot of overlapping stacking grounding zone wedges. So we've identified from the seismic as many as seven. And I say from the seismic, but, but boy, did the multi-beam help us with this interpretation. So in particular, there are these little things here, these little benches, those are individual grounding zone wedges. And I don't think we could have determined that without the multi-beam. So the multi-beam was big. As Soon as we start getting data, we start looking at it while we're on board, we process it on board. That's Ben Krogmeyer and I, one of my graduate students looking at the data that's just come in and comparing it to some of the, the data that we, we, we've had from uh, previous cruises. This is a, a, a line from um, 93, way back in 93. And um, so an old observation, it's a strike line going from Hayes Bank on the west across the basin to Houts Bank. And look at that beautiful wedge right in the center. So the line I showed you before was dip oriented, went right down at this location. And this is right through the thickest part of the grounding zone wedge. Okay. So we got the LGM unconformity there. And, and here's the post LGM compound grounding zone wedge. And there's the seafloor reflection. So I'll just, like I said, there's tons of seismic lines. We've correlated all through there, top and base of the wedge. These are all uh, dip oriented. Uh, lines, but we've got strike oriented lines from the outermost part of the basin where the wedge isn't, it's not seismically resolvable, to the middle part, that's the line I just showed you, to the inner part. So we can map out the wedge with all of that data, that's its distribution highlighted in gray between the two banks. So it's really trough confined, big, big, big pile of sediment. The one I showed you uh, first was right down the axis there. One of my students, uh, Matt Danielson, and, uh, did a really phenomenal job of mapping all of that data, correlating it all around. He mapped out the seafloor and got a really nice image from the seismic data. So the data density is sufficient to reproduce a bathymetry map that looks like this. The hot colors are high, the darker greens are, are low. So really good match. So that gives us confidence that we could map things in the subsurface with a data grid of that density. So here's Matt's map of the LGM unconformity. So basically you just remove all of the post LGM wedge and that's what it looks like. Okay. So you can see here, there's the, the axis of the, um, of the trough. That's a zoom of that. And you can see there's a lot of features inside the trough that are, uh, are labeled there. Um, so those little knolls and things like that were, were, were quite important in terms of the position that the grounding line occupied when it was retreating. So if you subtract the seafloor from the LGM unconformity, you get this isopac map, okay? And, and there's a, a, a blow up of that ton of volume. So we published this in, in 2017 and we used what we thought might be a good flux to estimate how long it would have taken to deposit that. So that's the volume of the wedge. So next I'm gonna show you some multi-beam data and, uh, and, and point out why that was also an important part of our, our study. And so here's what uh, a multi-beam survey does. While the ship's underway, there's a hull mounted system. This is the EM-122 on the Palmer and it sends out multiple beams 
that uh, reflect back and are corrected for the, the, the divergence in the travel path to give you a, a, a bathymetric image from wherever it is that you're, you're, you're doing your traverse. So we do this at about 10, 11 knots. We look at the data when it's coming on board. We edit the data. And everybody on board takes part of the uh, responsibility to edit the multi-beam. So by the time we're done, we, uh, if we're done, we can play some games, but we'll have all of that data uh, processed. So that's some of the folks who sailed with us in 2015. Maddie Myers was uh, the person who, who processed all of our seismic for us. So that's the image I showed you um, from before, from the Whale's Deep Basin with the grounding zone wedges, 5A, 5B, the big pile, and 5C. That's the multi-beam image we got. And remember, the big pile 5C has those little benches, right? Well, look at these benches. They're amazing. So now we're looking south, and it's showing a perspective view. I'll start here. This is the shelf edge. The blues are the deepest water on the upper slope. And then this is Houts Bank, the red, a shallow area, about 500 meters. There's Hayes on the, uh, the other side. And, and this is the saddle. The white lines with ticks are marking out the grounding line position of a grounding zone wedge. So look at the data in front of that, and you've got grounding zone wedge three, that's one of the benches. Grounding zone wedge two, that's another of the bench that we see on this line, and grounding zone wedge one. So we would have never figured that out without the multi-beam. This regional survey was, was quite important. So again, there's the seismic line, we were looking this direction, and there's the, the three little benches that show up so beautifully on the, um, on the, on the multi-beam. So this combination of first getting a regional view plus the, the really large-scale view of the uh, bathymetry was really important. So this is, uh, now we're looking straight down at the, uh, the bathymetry. This is the shelf edge, so north is up toward the top. And then the red lines are marking out grounding zone wedges. That's the, the LGM limit from Masola Anderson. This is the middle shelf position from Masola and Anderson. And then here's grounding zone wedge, one, two, three. Deposited in stratigraphic order, okay? And then this is, uh, this is one of the, um, the multi-beam data is from the reconnaissance survey that Masola and Anderson conducted. And if you look at that data, there's no way you would come up with this detailed an interpretation of the retreat history. So the big surveys are important, and I think folks are starting to recognize that. Um, this is a zoom of that, just to kind of show you again. So, so that's the position of the reconnaissance survey, and again, there's no way you would determine that to be three different wedges just from that. You really need this large scale feature. Another thing that's really important here is look at over here. So that's some sort of mass wasting that occurred. And, and so if you're, if you're looking to get good record of the retreat and or chronology from those sedimentologic records, obviously that's a place you'd want to avoid. And so again, you, you have to have this regional scale view to know, okay, this is a good place. You wouldn't want to be up here. It's totally churned up by iceberg furrows. That's a furrow as well. That's another area you'd want to avoid. And uh, so, so the regional scale view is, is quite, quite important. This is our line drawing interpretation of the, um, the, the multi-beam data and it's color coded for things older to younger. The LGM age stuff is in black. Those lines are called megascale glacial lineations. They form below the ice sheet when it's streaming. The red cluster of things is associated with something that's younger. It's grounding line one from grounding zone wedge one. And then after that, you had a, a second grounding zone wedge form. It's exposed in these places where you see the blue. That's grounding zone wedge two. It's got mega scale glacial lineations on at the top of it that do not cross this boundary. So that was the limit of ice at grounding line zone wedge two time. Same with three. And there's the big mass wasting event that occurred at some point either during or after that. Okay. And there's its, its lineation. And then this is the seafloor. That's the orientation of the grounding line during grounding zone wedge seven time. In the subsurface from this line, we know that grounding line wedge four was here, five was there, and six was stacked directly above it. So again, 
the combination, combination of those two things give us tremendous detail. We can also look at those grounding line positions with respect to the LGM topography. And that's something that Matt Danielson did. So here's Matt Danielson's LGM unconformity, basically minus all of the post LGM sediment. So there's the 500 meter contour line. It's a little bit of a bottleneck at this location. And there's a bunch of features, little knolls and saddles. These are some knolls and there's a saddle. Okay. And what I've superimposed on here is the grounding line positions for the first step back after the post LGM retreat. And look how those little knolls are controlling this edge of the grounding line. So that's grounding line one. Here's two again, just north of this knoll. There's three again hung up on the knoll. Four, five, six, and seven are hung up here above this saddle, but also at the bottleneck. And then we had aggradation of that sediment to give us the seafloor that you see here. And that produced this sort of um, four deep in surface on this part. And ice sheets don't like four deep in surfaces. They uh, sometimes decouple from those. And that's what we think happened here too. That idea of topographic control was something that was put out, um, was proposed by uh, Stuart Jamison and others in 2012. This is a map from their, their study. It's showing the Antarctic Peninsula, and this is the continental shelf. The gray lines show the trough width, and there it is in map view. And at these locations labeled one, two, three, four, five, those are little small grounding zone wedges. And you can see how there's a cluster of them that occur in the bottleneck. So it looks like topographic control is quite important. This is from um, the Pine Island Bay. This is a study by Jan Arntz et al. And um, they're kind of showing bathymetry here down in this location. And the browns are the shallowest parts. This was a former uh, pinning point. So it looks like topography is quite important in terms of controlling the, um, the retreat history. There's a zoom of the same image. So lots of bedrock knolls and whatnot. All right, next I'm gonna talk about um, something that happened on our way to work in Ross Sea. When everything was going fine, so well, we were playing cards and board games. And then we got a call from um, the head tech, Eric Hutt, and he said, Phil, we got a problem. We got a problem. I said, what's going on, buddy? We, we're, we're hot into Monopoly right now. I don't know if we, we can deal with any problems. But he said, no, you got to see this. So he, he took me to the back. And, and this is in the room that leads out to the back deck. So there was a, a, a line, a uh, high pressure hose that popped. That's the line that actually feeds the, uh, the seismic gun. And so there was a, a, a rupture there. And thankfully, nobody was there when it happened. They right away shut off the... Um, the air supply and um, got it fixed up. And so that's the, the, the repair that they were able to do. But um, while, while we were decommissioned there, we didn't continue our Monopoly game. We, got on, we said, well, let's collect some multi-beam data. So this is a survey now of the middle shelf. The bathymetric saddle is here, okay? So that's Houts Bank. And now we're a little further south from where I was showing you earlier. And look at these beautiful ridges, huh? You ever seen anything like that? So, so this is uh, bathymetry, there's your scale. And um, this is something from Masola and Anderson's paper, the reconnaissance strategy. That's where it would be positioned. We don't have any data there exactly, but you see a similar kind of ridges. They're about a kilometer or so spacing. They're as much as eight meters high, a couple of hundred meters wide. We mapped them out. We took some cross sections, and um, those are uh, some of the ridges we have identified. I think we got up to 45 or so, or at least pieces of them. This is our line drawing interpretation of those ridges. So again, we were looking up here earlier, and now we're back in this area, south of the bathymetric saddle. There's the Hayes saddle. There's the Hayes and the Houts bank. So lots of ridges traced out in the oranges, orange colors, OK? So um, here's what they look like in cross section. Really, really unusual features. So I put these little bars on this one of our work copies. We're counting up the heights and, uh, and width of them. 
So again, you know, uh, showing you spacing 1.2, 1 1.5, 1 1.35. Uh, the heights, this is in every one is a meter, so six, seven, eight or so meters, and, uh, and widths a couple hundred meters uh, uh, wide, and showing the water depths. So really unusual feature, there's a zoom in it. We're trying to measure the volumes of these as well. At one point, we thought we had these figured out while we're on board. This was the model we were dealing with. It's showing a cross-section evolution from Hayes to Houts Bank, fully grounded. There's the till that was a grading during grounding zone wedge seven, building up on the middle shelf to make that big saddle. And here's the width of the ice stream, 100 or so kilometers. But of course, you'd have to go through a shear zone where it slows down on the bank. And that shear zone, there's often crevasses. So in step two, we think that that zone of fast flow narrowed and it moved this shear zone over deforming till. And in this case, the crevasses extended to the base of the ice sheet in that model and injected into them and made these features that we're seeing preserved. We think that that process might have continued to shrink the zone of fast flow and made this ice then stagnant, but that zone of fast flow moved further into the axis of the trough. Another set of tills, um, you know, was injected into the crevasses. Eventually, the fast flow caused the ice shelf to unpin, and maybe during a short interval, this thing might have gone up and down by tidal motions and flattened the top of those. Ultimately, the ice retreated and left you the, with that. I so wish that story was defendable because I, I love it but I don't think it's defendable. So we're kind of moving away from that. Um, what you see here is a map from um, Halberstadt at all 2016. And Ruthie did an amazing job. She compiled all of the multi-beam data. And you can see this is from uh, their paper. This is the Whale Deep Basin where we collected our data. Okay, that's the, the, the image. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you the other, this is from all archive data. They didn't have our data. We got it in 2015. This paper came out in 2016. But if you combine these two, you can do something interesting. Okay. So what I, I, I want to show you is that some of these subglacial features are suggesting flow this way into the Wales Deep Basin. Same on this side. So Ruthie proposed that there must have big, been a big giant embayment that developed. So that's what I want to kind of show you here. I took data from the Halberstadt paper, the data that we generated in 2017 from Tinto, where they looked at the subglacial part of the Rosetta project plus stuff from Ringno to come up with this image here. It's a work in progress, but this is the boundary of the Wales Deep Basin. So the Ben Shapler was through here building this big giant wedge, right? And then all heck broke loose. And there was a big embayment that formed. This is the trend of those ridges that we see. And so we think it might have evolved something like this. So Hayes Bank, Houts Bank, here's the big saddle, the grounding line at grounding line wedge seven time. And then a large embayment started to form in the grounding line orientation. And it grew and it grew. This is coincident with the orientation of the ridges and the orientation of flow across uh, Houts Bank into this basin. So it looks like that process advanced that way. There's um, data from here that suggests that there might have been open water right after that rapid retreat. And we think this might have been centuries, just a few centuries. So this is some work that Juan Charles generated. It's showing KC-16, which was at the blue dot, that uh, blue arrow that I just showed you. From top to bottom, it's got these different lithophases interpretations, uh, interpretations of lithophases from grounded ice, short interval of open marine to a sub-ice shelf back to open marine. And, and here's why, because in this depth zone, it's not to scale. We got three or four right in over a short interval. There's a high percentage of Eucampia Antarctica. And that's, that's an open marine uh, signal, open marine signal. Everything else is, is dominated by things reworked in that zone. So we think there was a short interval during which 
open water exist. It would be consistent with that rapid retreat. Okay, part three, I hope I'm doing okay on time. But um, next we're gonna talk about some of the, the lithostratigraphy. So what you see is a cross section from outer shelf on the right to inner shelf right at the calving front. And there's the wedges. So this could have been formed by just a single transgression like this. From there, ice in cross section to here, to there, to there, to there, and then back to where it is now. So that's hypothesis one. Another view is that actually maybe each time it came all the way out and retreated back, all the way out and retreated back. So maybe this is six or seven or so cycles, full glacial cycles. We need chronology to be able to tell. But we could also use the, um, the, um, the, the lithostratigraphy to help us out as well. So we have to be strategic though and, and core in the right places. So here's our, our map again, and there's the regional line we've been looking at right down the axis. So we got the, the blue dots, those are out on the LGM surface, okay? And then we get the green arrows, I should say, they're showing the locations of core. We took the cores right on the four sets of those individual grounding zone wedges, okay? So really, really strategic. This one penetrates, if it gets deep enough, grounding zone wedge one diamic. That one, if it gets deep enough, it'll penetrate the diamic of two and three and seven, okay? And then back here, we should be on the top set of grounding zone wedge seven, okay? So we can be real strategic in terms of what we get. That's guided by this multi-beam image. So we got the multi-beam and then we did our coring very, very specifically getting into the four sets. There's the coring operation. There's the casting core and some sample uh, that we've taken out of it. We could start that process on board, but we really get that done when we go, you know, these are shipped stateside and we go to visit the, uh, the repository. It used to be in, in Florida, now it's in, in Oregon. But there's Austin McGlannon who did uh, most of the sedimentology. And there's Matt and I, uh, cleaning up after uh, after Austin did his work, looking at those cores. Matt focused on some of the forums. I'll talk about that in a minute. So again, here's that multi-beam, real strategic coring that we were able to do. We looked at, this is, is really beautiful to me. I'm still amazed by, it. here's an enormous open marine four set face. And we can core into it very easily. There's three of them into it. So here's those three cores, KCs three, five, and seven, and they all show the same thing, separated by several tens of kilometers. They bottom in a diamic, and they're capped by an open marine facey. So it must have looked something like this, a diamic, and then ice retreats, and we get open marine sedimentation. But no ice shelf, sub-ice shelf sediments were detected here, okay? So there's, two of the facies that uh, Austin described in his, his paper, uh, diamond and open marine sediment. That applies for all three cores on the grounding zone wedge seven four set. If you go to the north, the straddle type is different. You see the open marine, but then it comes into something that doesn't look like the diamond. It's not the diamond. Okay, we think that's associated with an ice shelf breakup. It's about 10 to 30 centimeters thick. We see it in four core on the outer shell. It's got a little increase in the abundance of chrysophytes, which are freshwater algae group, okay? And, and it's restricted to the outer shell. We only see it on the outer shell. That is underlain by stuff that is clearly sub ice shelf sediment. It's weakly laminates, loosely compact, a lot of sands, pellets, abundant foraminifera, but we don't see that anywhere on the grounding zone weight seven shell. Okay, we see that, that uh, to the north, uh, that straddle type to the north, and, and basically the same thing to the south, but not the ice shelf breakup. Here's our, our compilation of all of the core. We had seven, 16 of them from the outermost shelf to the inner shelf. This is where they were taken, sorry, with respect to our regional transect. Okay, so again, the straddle type 
on the grounding zone wedge seven four set goes till directly into open marine. But to the north, we got a sub ice shelf deposit, the pink, and an, another unit that we're interpreting as an ice shelf breakup, sandwiched between the till and the open marine. Okay, so that's really, really cool. And then if you look on the outer shelf, uh, sorry, the middle shelf here, this work's published now. Uh, we go grounding zone wedge, sub ice shelf, open marine deposit. So I'm throwing a lot at you, but um, uh, I'm gonna bring it all together here in, in a minute. So here's the core results that Austin generated for KC12. It goes from till, sub ice shelf, open marine, suggesting a single transgression of that grounded and floating ice sheet. Okay. Boom, to there, and it regrounded. Okay. So, so here's KC11. We see the same thing, except there's an ice shelf breakup unit. Okay. So it must have looked something like that. The ice shelf must have broken up and then retreated out. This is from KC10 now. We're on the four set. This one actually didn't penetrate deep enough to get into it, but we see the sub ice shelf, the ice shelf breakup, and the post glacial. Again, it's kind of suggesting, uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, on the opposite side here is the JPC from the same location. That one actually did get deep enough to penetrate into the till. But that's not the LGM till, that's a younger till. And we know that from the regional stratigraphic framework. That's grounding zone wedge one till. Okay, so it's younger, stratigraphically younger. But in any way you take it, it's still suggesting there's a single transgression. We're not seeing some oscillation of sub ice shelf, open marine, sub ice shelf, open marine to suggest that this was a really complex retreat. It looks like it was all part of a single retreat. And so um, same thing at KC9, okay? Grounding zone wedge, two diamic now, single transgression, and so on and so forth. So there's our multi-beam map again, and the, um, the, the core stations on the grounding zone wedge, seven, four set, and this is that, that core, KC7, uh, right there. This is, I should say, seven, grounding zone wedge, diamic, where we penetrate, and then it goes right into the open marine. Okay, so um, we did get tons of diatoms that helped us in, make this interpretation, and we got a lot of benthic and planktonic forams. So that's really good because it helps us date the event um, when, when ice was accumulating. And then KC15, that's way back here now. And so this used to be covered with ice. There's the diamic that was deposited when that was the case. Here's the sub ice shell facies that must have existed when that was the configuration. And then here's the open marine that must have existed when this happened. So we see a similar story at 16 with a little tweak to it. All right, here's the, the, um, the progression of events that happen. So I'm gonna let it roll. It's got 14 different steps. We're in the LGM configuration. This is basically going to build the stratigraphy that you've been seeing on the regional line I've been showing you right down the axis. And it's going to show you the, uh, uh, the core location. So there's the LGM. There's grounding zone wedge one, two, three, four. The ice shelf's going to break up, deposit that ice, ice um, you know, breakup unit, then a gray unit six, seven, five, six, seven, and then eventually retreat, recreate that big embayment that we talked about from um, the, was suggested by Ruthie Halberstadt's work, okay? And so this is the, um, uh, the little tweak I mentioned. It looks like there might've been an interval where the ice shelf didn't exist when the ice moved from grounding zone wedge seven, 200 kilometers back toward Roosevelt Island. But then we know from the lithostratigraphy at KC 16, that the ice shelf did reform. So we see just tons and tons of interesting stuff about that we can reconstruct once we start compiling all of this data. So the last thing is the, uh, the timing. So there's the, um, the regional lithostratigraphic cross-section with the facies color-coded. And 
here's some of the forams, SEMs of the forams. This is uh, Triferina and Globa cassigelina, and beautiful, beautiful uh, species. Um, um, our foram person um, was just going nuts looking at these really fine spines and these spinose uh, forms, and we're just absolutely certain these are they're in situ. We're finding them from three types of, of facies, from the open marine, from sub-ice shelf, and also from, um, from the grounding zone where it's diamic on, on seven, when there was a Calvin clip. And we've generated, this is Matt's work, uh, we've generated radiocarbon dates, done the corrections. So basically, Matt was the person who sampled it, sieved it, picked it, and sent these out for SEMs and then got um, some, uh, some radiocarbon dates. So ideally what we try to do is at any core station, look at the boundaries between sub-ice, uh, sorry, yeah, sub-glacial and sub-ice shell, try to date that. And we try to date the transition from when there was an ice shelf into an open marine environmental setting. So here's Matthew's counts for all the different foraminifera that he found there. And in this case, we got a really old date. And that's not too surprising because that one penetrates the LGM age um, diamic. And then we got a date of 13.9 here at that core. Here's another core from the outer shelf where the sub-ice shelf has a date of 13.8 within it, but we also get a 13.2. Here's another one from, uh, that penetrated into the grounding zone where it's two diamic. Down at the base, we get a 14.7, so that's pushing back the time of initial retreat. And we got a date just below the sub-ice shelf. It looks like the ice shelf broke up slightly after 12.3. And here's KC5 that goes into the grounding zone wedge seven, that's mislabeled, diamic. And we got a, a, the youngest date we got there was 11.5. Okay, so now we can add chronology. So what you see down at, uh, up at the top is the same image that I showed you with the 14 stages. And down below, it's a Wheeler diagram. A Wheeler diagram shows um, you know, distance along the, um, the horizontal, but the vertical is not depth. The vertical is time. So for example, down here between 16 and 17, we're arguing that's when grounding zone wedge one was being deposited. And out beyond the limits of that grounding zone wedge, there was a condensed interval of sub-ice shelf sediment. Ultimately, if you go far enough offshore, you should see open marine sediment in green. Okay, so it's basically showing the genetic relationships. And again, we couldn't do this without this regional framework. No way we would construct this. But now we can do that and we can get dates. Here's the date of 14.7. It's above grounding zone wedge two. Here's the date of 12.3 below the ice shelf breakup. That's an event bed. It's about 10 to 30 centimeters in one, two, three, four cores. We think it was winnowed away from this one. Okay, and here's Grounding zone wedges, five, six, seven. They're shown really thin here, but that's the thickest units on the cross section. We're, we're arguing that they formed really fast. They formed really fast because there was no ice shelf. The ice shelf just broke up. The flow accelerated. The flux was very, very high. And then after that time, we argue that the grounding line shifted very rapidly, 200 kilometers back to Roosevelt. So I'll let it run. The arrow's gonna show timing that's inferred in blue and, and red where we actually have pretty good dates for these different grounding events and when things occurred. So there it goes. I hope, yeah, grounding zone wedge one, two, at 14.7, it's already retreated. There's the ice shelf breakup around 12.3, an ice cliff. It stays, big pile of sediment because the flow is rapid. And then a rapid retreat back to Roosevelt Island, maybe an interval of uh, open marine condition, but the ice shelf reformed and then eventually shift it back to where it is now. Okay, so, so again, one of the important things here was that we see an interval where an ice shelf broke up and an immediate acceleration of flow, fully consistent with the glaciologists learned when the Larsen Ice Bee broke up. All of those glaciers increased their flow. And here we're seeing the same thing in the paleo record. 
And, and not only that, we can see that it precipitated after a few centuries of that rapid flow, a really rapid retreat. So we haven't had that play out yet in the real world, but that's the kind of thing that the, the glaciological community is, is very concerned about. So again, a really nice example of, uh, of ice shelf breakup, accelerated flow leading to, uh, to retreat. So everything I talked to you about concerned this little area right in here. And, um, and this is a regional line all the way from the shelf edge to the up dip limit of the, um, the Ben Shadler ice stream, okay? And so I just wanted to put that in context. So, so this is the line we've been talking about and all of the detail that fits into here. So we can see that there was a, a very long interval of time where it hung out here about 70 kilometers back Right, and and that's almost like a still stand, a grounding line still stand. Some some oscillations, but pretty much hung out in the same place for as many as three thousand years, and then it retreated very rapidly. That rapid retreat recorded by those little small ridges, okay, and then ultimately it made its way back to Roosevelt Island, and the the work from Conway suggests that it hung out there a long time up until 3000. So our data suggests it got there at like 11.5. So that's a really long grounding event. There should be a really sizable grounding zone wedge here. But I don't think the current um, resolution of the Rosetta data that's surveyed below the ice shelf can pick it up. Um, and then it shifted back. The biggest shift, the biggest shift has occurred since 3000 years ago. That's about 500 kilometers retreat. So maybe we're in a still stand right now. We know that there's a lot of oscillations that occur. Okay. So anyway, I've got to my conclusion. So it looks like the initial retreat occurred around, at, had begun by 14.7. That is consistent with this early view of retreat being consistent with um, being caused by rise. So this would have been at that time and could have been caused by meltwater pulse 1A. Yes. If so, it doesn't look like this was a big contributor of, uh, to it because it was only, it's a 70 kilometers, 70 kilometers is four, but that's not enough ice volume to have been the cause of the sea level rise. It looks like it hung out on the outer shelf that um, where the saddles built. Uh, for a few millennia, maybe as many as three. But then at 11.5, there was a big shift. And again, it's a kind of remarkable um, you know, coincidence that 11.5 is right when meltwater pulse 1B occurs. And um, so um, there's a possibility that was a contributing factor. In this case, there was a tremendous loss of ice volume. There was capture from the adjacent ice streams, the Glomer Challenger and, and the Little America ice streams um, at that time. This might have been a contributor to sea level rise at that time. And then the largest part of the retreat, we're talking about all those details on the outer shelf, the biggest retreat the, occurred after 3.2 thousand years. So I want to thank you guys for your attention and I hope I didn't go over the time limit but uh, I went over a little, so I'm sorry about that, but, um, no. but thanks for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. And so, um, so ton, just so much information, so, so many <laughs> great conclusions and rewriting history on this. Mm. And so um, at this point, uh, we, will take, we can take some questions. Um, so um, I am kind of new to Zoom. I don't know if you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and just ask a question. I think that's probably the easiest way. And so um, any questions, because I have a few to start it off with. And so, um, so you know, this, so you, you talk about the, the big uh, meltwater pulse, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for them, I actually invited uh, some of my non-majors uh, to this talk. And so they were probably getting pretty, um, impressed over some of the new lingo here but meltwater pulse pulse is basically when the ice sheet when a lot of water went into the ocean from the melting glacier and uh and and sea level rose quite quickly during this time and so 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 although you know the, the meltwater you know ross sea you know the, that ice sheet is not going to be the um 
main contributor, but it's probably, it could be um, indicating that most of the Antarctic ice sheet uh, could be retreating as well. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's right. So that they, um, for some of the students who might not know about the meltwater pulses, they, those were, there were two of them that occurred since the last glacial maximum. And um, over a few centuries, sea level was rising at rates of like 30, 35, 40 millimeters per year versus the current pretty high rate of like three, right, millimeters per year. So centuries long interval with uh, 10 times higher sea level rise. And the idea would be if the ice was grounded in a marine environment, it might reach its buoyancy limit over that interval of time when sea level rises. And so, yeah, it could be a driver of something that is regional in scale. Um, but, you know, I think what's, what's important too is to say, to demonstrate that the, the other core, other troughs have a similar uh, history. And we just don't have that level of detail from the chronology yet. Certainly the data, the geophysical data, the sedimentologic data suggests that they experience retreat. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we don't know if their chronology was, was similar. And then another thing I'll point out that the resolution of our chronology is not enough to, to establish cause and effect. So, you know, a radiocarbon date is actually a range of dates. Mm -hmm. And so with, given that it's a range of dates, it could have been that the retreat preceded, occurred during, or post-dated the most rapid in, interval of rise. Mm -hmm. but, um, but anyway, I think it, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that the, the, the big retreats that we know happened seem to overlap in time with those events. And what's interesting is what, you know, uh, were these melt water pulses coming from the Southern Hemisphere or from the Northern Hemisphere? Yeah. So you're providing evidence that, it, that there was at least some contribution to, for, from the Southern Hemisphere. And in fact, I, you know, at the moment you started popping up the 11.5 thousand years ago, I, I kind of quickly looked at, um, when I was on the Wilkes Land Expedition in 2010, we drilled into the Delhi Basin. And the Delhy Basin is this where a place where a super high sedimentation rates over the last 11,000 years. And by the way, the date for, for the um, grounding line to retreat off to at least our site was 11.6 thousand years ago. How about that? Yeah. I can't believe it. I, I think there is something to it, Steve. And even I've seen, uh, I can't remember the, the, the reference, uh, but there's some suggestion that even some terrestrial areas that feed ice into Ross Sea mm -hmm. might have experienced deflation around the same time. So um, I, I think even um, Brenda Hall, it's, some of her work suggests that this timing for A, not so much evidence that that meltwater pulse 1A might have been driven by Ross Sea of uh, contraction of the ice there, but that most likely B, would, would be um, a, a better candidate. And that's a little different than what folks were, were talking about. You know, when you and I were just finishing up our PhD, there were more talk about um, Antarctica potentially being um, uh, a source of, of A. Yep, exactly. So, so are there any questions out there? Sidiro, may I have a question? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Philip, I'm truly is uh, is uh, outstanding talk. I like very much. So you research have provides awesome evidence for this as a sheet oscillation um, back and forth. Yeah, that's that's that's. Uh, that's awesome, and it's so exciting, it's, it's so cool. And so I'm a modeler, so from this uh, energy balance modeling point of view, uh, so how your evidence can give some interpretation for this energy balance, for example, when this earth sheet is, is tainted to the ocean, you know, that's uh, eliminated, 
uh, evaporation, so that may be eliminated the precipitation, and also this S will act as isolator, you know, no energy exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. So yeah. this S sheet, uh, there are two, two functions. One is a limited uh, mass exchange with atmosphere for the water and also isolated energy exchange with uh, between water and atmosphere. When this S sheet retreat, so this is another the upside. So this oscillation and the energy balance imbalance oscillation. So do you have any link between your evidence and this modular point of view? <laughs> well, you know, uh, thanks, thanks for your, uh, your question. And um, I, I, do, I, I do have a slide here that uh, might, might be, uh, I think I have to, let me see if I can, I think what I did was I, I hid the slide. Okay. So let me see. I have to unhide it and just give me a second. Okay. And I'll try to go back here in screen view. Okay. Did it come back up? Yes, it's up. Okay. So, um, so, so anyway, you were asking about, um, you know, uh, how, how this might relate to things, modeling and energy. Look, we can see two slides right now. Okay. Let's see if I can do that mode. Yeah. There it goes. Okay, good. Thanks, Steve. So, so this is our chronology, okay? Uh, and, and it's hard to, uh, to make sense of this. So let me say a minute. Right now, that, well, this is showing the extent of ice out from where it currently is grounded, the modern grounding line position, all the way out to the shelf edge. Okay. okay? And so that's a time axis. So this was back at when we think 17,000-ish was when it was grounded here. And then it had this contraction through, from time one to time seven, abrupt shift to here at Roosevelt, and then shifted back somehow in 3,000 years to where it is now. Okay, so, so, so all of that stuff is um, a compilation of, of different bits of evidence. So there's so, uh, solar insulation is the first thing that's shown here, okay? So uh, lots of uh, early work suggested solar insulation is the, the primary driver. And so this is Southern Hemisphere solar insulation, seeing when it peaked, okay? So actually, the solar insulation was declining mm -hmm. when this early retreat occurred. That's kind of peculiar, but at the same time, the proxy for temperature from the West Antarctic Ice Sheet divide suggests that temperature was rising. Mm -hmm. So there, there had to be some atmospheric uh, control on, on this uh, retreat. And um, one other thing that's kind of intriguing to us is there's this change here and then a, a more rapid increase in um, Delta O18. Okay, which is interpreted as a, a, a warming. So this is around the time that we think the ice shelf broke up. So that's potentially related to that. But there's other data here suggesting that um, there's uh, sea surface temperature warming around the Southern Ocean. So that's believed to be a driver. This is an increase in opal flux that occurred, suggesting that there must have been some ocean warming that was influencing it. That's the CO2 record. This is, uh, whoops, ah, uh, uh, sorry, no this is the CO2 record, which suggests that the ocean was upwelling somewhere in Antarctica to transfer a lot of CO2 from the, from the ocean back to the atmosphere. So, so that's also suggesting that it might not have just been, you know, a warming ocean and atmosphere, uh, but the warm water might have been intruding onto the shelf in places. So, so um, oh, yeah, so I think that's the sea level stuff. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, and I, I'm in communication with some, some modelers to try to see if they can um, tease out some of the more cause and effect relationships 
So our job is kind of like establishing, here's the physical record of the retreat with its timing. And we're really, right now, we're trying to understand the, uh, the connections to things, energy balance, and, and uh, try to get a handle on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, for uh, s WGC, there is a peak. You interpret that is as brick and uh, looks like insulation albedo. Insulation relates to the albedo, that's very smoothly. No corresponding peak. That may be uh, relates to the time lag or something. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah, yeah. there's. Um, there's uh, some other stuff that I didn't include on here, but there's uh, you know, a connection to things, um, uh, thermohaline circulation, when that um, strengthens and weakens, it looks like there's a little bit of a, a pi- bipolar effect that may be at play here. I thought I had that on here, but yeah, uh, it's blocked out, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Great question. Uh, so, um, any other questions that would, um, anybody else? So, okay, so I have another question. Because, okay. um, because uh, actually I invited and I see actually see a number of um, my non-major students um, uh, listed here. So that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. Um, and so, so there in my non-majors class is about climate change. And so, so you know, I guess so. You were you did an amazing job at uh, really uh, characterizing and explaining what this uh, what the surface features are in terms of retreat and pinning. You know, um, but with these uh, shawls and everything, can you spec? Would like to speculate on how your data could maybe be applied to at, during our current warming period, where we're expecting the ice sheets to further retreat. And, and also, you know, this is some of the um, variables of getting hung up on, on highs and so on and so forth. Well, um, yeah, the, uh, this is something I think is just so fun to yeah. think about. And so um, one of the papers we just put out talked about the, the timing between a, um, uh, an ice shelf breakup and a subsequent really big um, response in terms of the ice sheet's extent and its volume. Okay, so what we found was that um, in in this particular basin that the ice shelf broke up at around um, 12.3, 12.3, and and usually the expectation is that as soon as that happened, all bets are off. Look out, that's it. Everything's going to change, and um, and so, you know, there, there's concern that when you remove the ice shelf, there's a, a big time acceleration of flow. Mm-hmm. Very clear. And so that, like I mentioned, that happened at Larson. What this record shows is that that did happen. Mm-hmm. But it also shows something very important that is intriguing. It suggests that that acceleration lasts for centuries centuries and only after centuries do you get a big contraction in the extent of ice so the whole time there's um, a long interval of high discharge that could could contribute to sea level rise but the biggest contraction occurs after a few centuries so it's centuries long delay in uh, ice shell breakup and big retreat so here's the question especially you know for um you know your non-majors but i think for all of us is uh you know when we see the next ice shelf break up we shouldn't be thinking man you guys told me everything was going to change and look at this it's been 10 years nothing happened you know where's the big thing well this paleo data suggests that that could be delayed by a couple of centuries but you know it, it's it's nonetheless geologically speaking instantaneous but um there there's 
you know, a difference in, in the, uh, the time scale of things. And I think it's, it's one of the, the uh, it, it's hard to appreciate. It's hard to appreciate it because we live in human time scales, right? So, uh, but these processes, these big ice sheets, they, they can take decades to centuries to respond. And so that's one thing that I'm kind of intrigued by that I, I, we, we can see there's tremendous change that's occurring. I mentioned the Pine Island, the Thwaites system, the ones about which we're most concerned. And in that case, it's got a little tiny ice shelf. And if that ice shelf breaks up, I'm sure we're going to see an, a further acceleration. But it might be 200 years before we see that thing <laughs> really retreat back. We won't see it, right? And, and what I'm afraid of is that there'll be a lot of people who, say, who throw up their hand and say, man, you scientists have been telling us to look out. We'll, we'll have been right, I think, but it's not going to be in our lifetime. It may, it not, may not even be in our grandkids' lifetime. Mm -hmm. it, it'll be, a, you know, it'll take a century. Yeah. Yeah, and we just don't know. I mean, your evidence is, is one example yeah. So and then it's just one example with certain uh, topography and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. and we just don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, just to follow up with the twelve point three break, where it suddenly becomes open marine. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything in the global records that that uh, that correlates to that? Well, the only thing that um, we could see is that there's a um, there's this increase here. And so this is global scale, um, you know, increase in temperature following the Antarctic climate reversal. That's, that shift that way means that it was getting colder at the West Antarctic ice sheet divide. Right. And, then, and this means that it was getting warmer and or that it was deflating. Exactly. And both of those would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, there's that. There's, uh, I, I wish it showed up, but that's also during a time when, um, the um, younger drivers. Amox, Amox got weak. Well, Amox, okay. Amox got weak, okay. and so that's a global scale. The Atlantic Meridional no overturning current. Mm -hmm. uh, so that really big cell, when it gets weak and shuts down, the Southern Ocean gets warmer. Exactly. So it could be that it was related to that time, and. Um, so, but it's hard to, to, to say, it's hard to say, um, but yeah, those are the kind of interesting questions that, that, uh, that we need to be able to, to, uh, to address to kind of understand if it's, if it's something that's uh, localized or something that's more pan-Antarctic in scope. Yeah, sure, exactly. Mm -hmm. If it's something regional or the global, there's a global signal there. Yeah. And so, um, so it's 12, it's 135, I mean, any last questions for, for, from the group? Okay. I think you just totally wowed them. Uh, <laughs> I'll be talking about this tomorrow with both my geology class and, um, and my non-majors class. So, All right. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, let's um, give another round of applause. Um, and you can take off your microphones for a second if you want, but I'm going to stop recording.